Hey everybody, this is Kodok here, and I figured this week, rather than making some petty video talking about how we were told that Pokemon Sword and Shield were finished games throughout the entire holiday shopping season, only after that season was over did they tell us actually the game isn't finished and we're going to need at least another $33 from everybody now, please. I figured I would make a video about the games I have been playing instead, which might be just as petty, but I don't know. The monster game genre, a type of video game popularized by Pokemon where the player collects and trains a fun variety of creatures from a massive world full of different environments which are populated by more of these creatures. While many were guilty of simply copying the formula Pokemon put out, a ton of them have actually taken the core mechanics in an interesting direction which can really scratch the itch of anybody who's sick and tired of Pokemon's gameplay. And we're going to talk about five of them today, which Considering I have the components of about 10 games sitting on here, I actually haven't spoiled anything by what I have on the table. A few quick comments before I go into this. The monster game genre does not include games where you steal or borrow the powers of monsters, nor the few games where you collect a group of characters to play as, so no Castlevanias, no Final Fantasies, no Mega Mans, no Skylanders. Second, despite there being literally thousands of them, I'm not including any cell phone or browser games on here because Frankly, they're a dime a dozen and all mostly play the same way with maybe the exception of Pokemon Go. Honestly, odds are good your favorite franchise, whether about monsters or about people, has some sort of pay-to-win garbage game attached to it, so if you do play any of these, try to at least make sure it's an official game by an actual studio. And so with that, let's get started. Here, in no particular order, are five great monster games that aren't Pokemon. <laughs> Might as well start with the granddaddy of all Japanese role-playing games, Dragon Warrior. Known these days by its official title, Dragon Quest, these Ultima-inspired games were a huge source of inspiration for the creation of Pokémon with their appealing and even cute and friendly monster designs created by Dragon Ball Z creator Akira Toriyama, which you can kinda see in a lot of Pokémon's designs and mechanics. Dragon Quest V, released in 1992, four years before Pokemon, even has a mechanic that allows you to recruit monsters to join your team, though they behave more like hidden party members rather than a full-blown monster game. This inspired the idea of a game all about monster collecting, and another incident regarding a very rare in-game item from a different Dragon Quest game sparked the creation of the trading system. So, once Pokemon came out and proved to be popular, out came Dragon Quest Monsters, a Game Boy Color game which uses a kid form of one of the characters from Dragon Quest VI named Terry, who recruits monsters through a sort of Dragon's Quest Greatest Hits series of worlds. But the game I'm talking about today is the sequel to that game, Dragon Warrior Monsters 2, Tara's Adventure and Kobe's Journey. Unlike the long-winded tournament saga in the first game based on stories from the franchise, the sequel game has its own unique story where, due to an act of mischief gone wrong by the local prince Kameha... Oh, Akira Toriyama designed a character named Kameha? Who would have seen that one coming? The island you live on, called Great Log, is now in danger of sinking. It's up to you, as either Tara or her big brother Kobe, to find a strong enough magical plug to seal the leaking hole and save the island, all while trying to avoid catching the attention of the evil Dark the Collector. The game does copy Pokémon's dual game gimmick, but the only real difference between these games is who you play as, either as Tara or as Kobe, with the other character taking care of the monsters you send home. There is a slight difference in the available monsters in the areas you unlock as part of the main story, but nothing is technically out of your reach in either game with enough diligence. Otherwise, it changes how one puzzle goes. It really is just a choice of character. Now, when it comes to battles, the game plays like a classic Dragon Quest game, where all three of the monsters on your team fight at once and use their special attacks by spending magic points. There's a bit of a quirk which makes you want to use the game's AI to fight with, as the monsters can get better at making their own decisions over time. You want this, as there are sections of the game where they have to fend for themselves, so you're better off giving them vague commands to urge them into fighting or using healing magic. You can grab the reins if you get into trouble, but it's designed to feel like other Dragon Quest games where you can't fully control your characters. You catch monsters in the wild by feeding them meat, which can win them over into joining you once the battle is over, but rather than evolving into stronger forms, you improve your arsenal by breeding the monsters. 
By freeing two monsters, they can leave behind an egg containing a new monster with all of their combined skills and an even greater potential. The game doesn't even allow trading. Both players instead put up a monster to breed with and both get back an egg as the result. Certain breeding combinations can even produce newer, bigger monsters, including a ton of the game's bosses. Yeah, you know the bosses in Dragon Quest, right? The ones whose transformations are so grotesque that they make the ones from Resident Evil look tame by comparison? Like this guy from the fourth game who starts off as this big bug thing, but then you cut off his arms, and then you cut off his head, but then he grows another head from out of his stomach, and then a new pair of big beefy arms from before finally growing another head on top of his... head? can have one! That's your baby now! Yeah! Superpowered lab experiments are broke, while constantly mutating sins against creation are woke. Shoot, this fight's even gruesome in the original Nintendo version. I am not kidding when I say that in this game you can get every form of every final boss in every Dragon Quest game up to Dragon Quest VII. Speaking of Dragon Quest VII, by the way, do yourself a favor and don't make that your first mainline Dragon Warrior game. Really, don't. Do not make my mistake. Start with 4 or 8, but for the love of God, do not play 7. It is nothing but pain and suffering. Spare yourself. If you don't stop at the Wellside Casino before you go to Dharma Temple, you are going to die! But yeah, definitely get a monster breeding guide if you plan on playing this game. Thankfully, the game itself is not too hard to find and plays on a ton of hardware. Everything from the Grey Brick Game Boy to the Retron 5. So honestly, I'd say track it down. Heck, the Japanese version is even cheaper. My copy here, I actually got for only a dollar. And I actually bought it because I really like the cover because it reminds me of... <laughs> There is even a remake in Japan for the 3DS, which combines both games and leaves it up to a simple character select. But we're never going to get the remake outside of Japan because the first Dragon Quest Monsters game in 3D, Dragon Quest Monsters Joker, did not sell very well outside of Japan, and it didn't sell very well outside of Japan because it wasn't very good. Hard pass. Honestly, Dragon Warrior Monsters 2 for the Game Boy Color is the way to go. It Yeah, I know I've said I'd never talk about this game series again, and I might have come across as a bit excited that this thing's bloated, overblown international release crashed and burned, but honestly, I still think Yokai Watch is a great series of games. Well, the first two are anyway. Yokai Watch is a game where you play as a kid who one day finds a device that lets them see the spirits inhabiting the world called the Yokai, who cause all of life's little unpredictable moments. Like with Dragon Quest, the yokai fight in groups of three and can be wooed to join you with food, though you have to know what foods each yokai prefers. Unlike the fantasy setting in Dragon Quest, however, the game is a modern urban adventure, like a kid's novel or an episode of Twilight Zone or Goosebumps. Now, something that a lot of monster games have experimented with is the technique of adding monsters into the game from outside sources, such as with trading cards or special passwords, or some games even scan music CDs, but none have been more financially successful than the Yokai Watch Yokai Medals, which are special toys that could either go into a special version of the watch you get in the game, or you can scan the QR code on the back, which unlocks a token which you can redeem at an in game store to maybe unlock a cool yokai, a yokai like Izanami. I prefer the first Yokai Watch game thanks to its excellent pacing and intimate hometown setting. It reminded me of the sorts of things I would get up to when I was younger and makes the case that despite the big worlds and other monster games, that there might just be tons of adventure to be found in your own backyard. Helps that as of this video going up, you can nab it brand new for just five bucks. Two has a larger scope and a much more cohesive plot, but the pacing is slow as molasses and it takes a long time for the game's best features to show up. Still, it's a bestseller for a reason. Ryokai Watch 3, however, reeks of a game made by a company that felt they could do no wrong. 
The pacing issues of 2 are literally doubled down on by giving you two characters to grind levels for instead of just one, the plot makes little sense, and you can see the vestiges of all the toy-themed gimmicks which got stripped out of the American version, which drops the three-game release down to a single game, which honestly is how the game should have been done here all along. It seriously needed some quality of life improvements over the second game that just didn't happen. It was only a mild seller in Japan, too. I guess people finally got sick of a game that uses the same map with the same graphics and the same music for three games in a row. The fourth game I'm not touching with a 10-foot pole, because it looks like every 2-bit beat-em-up RPG people have been putting out lately. Ugh, that talk went south quick. Yeah, just stick to the first two. Kinda hard to talk about alternatives to Pokemon without bringing up Digimon. Digimon has been in a lot of trouble recently thanks to the lukewarm reception to Digimon Try and the abject failure of Atmon, but the video games have proven to be a solid line of work, simmering reliably below the surface while the rest of the franchise struggles. The problem is, I haven't played most of them. The Digimon toys are technically their own video games of the sort of digital pet variety, and the actual series of games I'm talking about, Digimon World, has been around in America since the PlayStation 1. But when I jumped into the series with the first version on the Nintendo DS, I was pleasantly surprised, though again, I think the sequel is better. Digimon World Dawn and Dusk actually takes the way Dragon Quest handled the two-game approach to a new level by giving each version of the game its own story. Yeah, each game, Dawn and Dusk, has a completely different story due to being told from a different perspective. Hey, Game Freak, when are we gonna get something like this, huh? The game uses an isometric view where you explore various places in the digital world and fight against angry Digimon with your full team of three, though you also get to bring a relief row. Unlike in games like Pokemon, where your monsters are either permanently transformed or fused into stronger forms, the monsters in Digimon World have a whole evolution grid that they can freely move up or down as long as they can meet the level requirements, obtaining new skills and gaining new forms all over the place. There's a decent chance that a Digimon might start its life on one Digivolution tree and end on another. Again, I like this sequel better. It has a better story and a longer list of characters, including two new lines of Digimon made especially for them, Apollomon and Dianamon. Heh, <laughs> Digimon was doing the sun and moon thing long before Pokemon even thought of it. There's also this neat part where you sort of boundary break the digital world and end up in these unstable planes full of powerful Digimon carrying this really oppressive battle music. You really feel like you've wound up in some place you were never meant to see. It's great! This sort of cyberpunk angle is probably why Digimon Dusk proved to be the more popular of the two. Popular enough that one of its playable characters actually makes a guest appearance in the latest Digimon video game, Digimon Cyber Sleuth, a game that I have also not played, mostly because I didn't have any of the consoles that played it when it first came out, although apparently there's a version of it for Switch, but I haven't gotten around to playing it. I've heard wonderful things about the game, and if it shares any of the pedigree with the DS games, then I'm sure I'm in for a treat, but all I really know about Cyber Sleuth right now is that its 3D assets are being used for those sorts of gross phone games that I've been warning people about still. Maybe I'll give that some coverage sometime, and I am genuinely excited for the upcoming reboot. And now for perhaps the most obscure game on this list. I actually started a Let's Play of this game on my other channel, Game Doc, which frankly gets no attention, but then I lost about three hours of footage, and, you know, that kinda killed that. Magi Nation started its life as a card game that came out at a good time before the huge glut of them we got at the early 2000s, using anime-styled artwork and some unique game mechanics. It had plans to become a full-on franchise with toys, video games, and even a cartoon show. Now, while a lot of that didn't happen, the card game petered out, and the TV show was delayed to the point of irrelevance, we at least got to see the video game, and it's actually really good. In this game, you play as Tony Jones, a kid from Earth who finds himself stranded on the Moonlands, a fantasy land full of different realms based on the standard elements who have recently come under threat from dark forces known as the Core. The monsters in this game, called Dream Creatures, are recruited by taking parts of them left behind in battle, little crystals called Infused Animite, and combining them into a ring that lets you summon them in battle. 
keep in mind this was long before all the phone games that did this exact freaking thing. But the truly interesting thing is how you use these monsters. Tony has one stat, life points, and you call on your dream creatures by giving them a chunk of these life points, which then becomes their life points, which they can then cash in to perform stronger attacks. There are ways to get your HP back. You get back your monster's remaining life points at the end of the battle, as well as half the points an enemy creature had when it gets defeated, and Tony can take a turn to get a little energy back rather than summoning, using items, or casting spells. It becomes an interesting game of nursing your life points for longer treks and tougher missions. And there is a lot to hunt down. There's an optional area that changes the ending, and the best kept secrets, powerful dragon dream creatures called Hyrens, are carefully hidden away but well worth the trouble of tracking down and recruiting. You'll also find something cool if you set off a blast pot in the underwater city. Sadly, as the most obscure game out of this lot, it's also probably the hardest to find. You're probably gonna have to buy it online, but Oddly enough, I haven't seen it priced used at more than 10 bucks unless you're buying a boxed copy, so it's not very hard to find, and just like Dragon Warrior Monsters 2, it can be played on the Retron 5, so I'd say give it a shot. Now, before I move on to my number one game, I figure I ought to cover a few honorable mentions, because I'm sure if I didn't, a lot of you at the comments would be pretty upset at me. Monster Rancher is a series of games that made its name on the PlayStation with how you added new monsters by playing music CDs in your console. I tried the version on the DS, which uses a different method to add monsters, but the gameplay didn't really appeal to me. Extremely heavy focus is put on the raising of the monsters over the exploring and battling, and that just didn't trip my trigger. Invisimals was an odd little title for the PSP, which uses augmented reality to make your monsters appear in the real world. I didn't really like how scripted everything felt, and the live-action stuff really threw me off. Spectrobes is an interesting beast, coming from Disney of all places. It involves digging out monster fossils to fight with in a sort of... conga line? The sequel at least has the benefit of being playable, where you take direct control of one of your monsters rather than... There's also this dot card input method, which you can easily find tutorials for online to do it without the cards. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about Shin Megami Tensei 2, just to shut up the people who try to mention it in the comments. While the original game, which even predates Dragon Quest V, was a dark story about recruiting angels and devils, the series itself has kind of been overshadowed by a spin-off series Persona, where the monsters are instead worn as equipment rather than summoned into battle. Zoid's Legacy is a very good game, but it's kinda hard to recommend for people who aren't huge fans, and honestly it kinda walks the thin line between being a monster game and being a regular RPG. Robopon is a blight upon all mankind because of all of the disgusting things associated with this development, and it will never be talked about on this channel ever again. Temtem isn't on the Switch yet, and I don't have a Steam account, so maybe they'll send me a code sometime? I don't know. And so we come to the final game on the list. I mean, of course, it was gonna be Fossil Fighters. Back in the early 2000s, there was a small batch of fossil monster games where the gameplay loop involved digging up fossils to revive into monsters. Two of these games were either attached to a huge franchise or were made by big studios, and then along comes this little unassuming game that blew both of them out of the water. Fossil Fighters, a little backburner game by Nintendo R&D, sees the player going around digging up dinosaur fossils in order to revive them into cartoony reincarnations called Vivasaurs, who have gained special powers due to the revival process. These dinosaurs, stored in special dino metals, are used in three-on-three -three battles with one Vivasaur in the forward position with two more supporting it on the flanks. There are a few things that I think put this game above the other fossil games. First of all, it's a lot more fun to see these cartoony dinosaurs fighting with the Looney Tunes expanding heads and arms, which makes it less visceral than the realistic dinosaurs from Dinosaur King. It also has a lot of really deep strategy. You can't just load up on beefy dinosaurs, as they actually inflict penalties on your lead dinosaur when they're in the support zones rather than benefits. But I think another big difference is how fossils are handled. In other fossil games, there's a mini-game involved in digging the fossil out, but while most games make you do this on the spot, Fossil Fighter sees you extract the entire rock from the ground to later clean up at the lab, letting you ease between gameplay styles. There's also this neat mechanic where some fossil rocks cause another Fossil Fighter to appear, claiming to have found the rock first and making you fight to keep it. Imagine if in Pokemon you found a rare creature and then a trainer popped up saying they saw it first and you had to battle for it. 
The first game is a bit strange, however. The character models are primitive and the story has more nonsensical plot twists than a bad sci-fi serial, but it's all in good fun. The sequel, however, irons out a lot of these problems with better graphics, a more cohesive story, and the ability to play as either a boy or a girl. It also adds a twist to the combat where your vivasaurs are instead placed on a wheel that can be rotated at any time, where the ones in the back half of the wheel apply their support skills to those in the front half, and all of them have a certain sweet spot relative to the enemies where their moves are the most effective. It even has a new game plus mode where you can carry all of your dino medals forward when you start the game over. A new game plus mode in a monster collecting game is kind of unthinkable, but this game actually manages to do so without diminishing the challenge. And I didn't even mention the trading mechanic. Rather than trading vivasaurs, instead you shoot rocks at people with a giant cannon. It's actually kind of metal. The third game, Fossil Fighters Frontier, sort of throws away everything that made the first two so good, so I can't recommend it at all, unfortunately. Like with Yokai Watch, two is the magic number. And so, there you have it! If you're sick and tired of Pokemon but want something to scratch that itch, here are my recommendations. None of these are really going to break the bank either. In fact, only Dragon Warrior Monsters 2 or Fossil Fighters Champions will break the $20 mark. And with Dragon Warrior Monsters 2, you can actually get a boxed copy for less than $10 if you're willing to buy the Japanese version. Heck, all of these games added together at their current prices is less than a copy of Sword and Shield. You can get five great games for the cost of just one. So, there you have it. I imagine I might be throttling back on some of this content coming forward, and uh, next time you see me, I'm going to be at Toy Fair. So, until then, this is five great games that aren't Pokemon, and this is Kodox signing off.